Welcome back to Ty and That Guy. Thank you for joining us. I'm Wes Chatham. I'm Ty Frank. And today we're talking about The Expanse, episode 503. Tommy Jane, our very beloved Detective Miller, directed this episode. It was so fun and exciting to watch. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Uh, it, was, it was exciting to, uh, to continue working with him, even if he's behind the camera. It's just always great to have him on set. I'm a little uh, pissed off, though, Ty, because... I was so excited when I found out old Tommy J was directing and I could not wait to work with him, but I was no, I was not in this episode. I didn't get to work with Thomas Jane. Yeah. Well, we didn't think you guys would work well together. So we <laughs> brought you out of this one. Yeah. This episode, um, one of the major characters who's new to season five gets a lot of play in this episode is uh, Admiral Felix Delgado played by uh, Michael Irby, who apparently you knew from before. Yeah. When you were working on uh, the unit, right? Yeah, so Michael Irby's a good buddy of mine because uh, I got to work on the unit with him and uh, we had such a good time. And I found out, I, I didn't even know uh, he was going to be on the show. Him and I stay in touch. We talk every now and then. And uh, <laughs> we were rehearsing and I walked in the rehearsal room and there, were, there he was. And it was so exciting to see him there. And a funny story is we went to eat that night and we're sitting at a dinner table and there was a group of guys sitting next to us and they were at the other dinner table. And uh, this guy came up and said, Jesus Christ. He says, my two favorite shows are The Unit and The Expanse. And he says, what in the <laughs> hell are you guys doing in Toronto? And then, and then we said, well, uh, Irby's now, uh, he's going to be working on The Expanse. And he says, oh, my God, I cannot wait. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was so much fun to get to work with him again and get to hang out with him. And, and I thought he did really, really great work. Yeah, he was uh, fantastic as, uh, as sort of a Vassarala's right-hand man, uh, her military uh, buddy on Luna. This really, uh, this episode begins sort of the major Avasaral arc, you know, with her trying to track down what's going on that, you know, that rock that, uh, that flew past Venus that wasn't supposed to be there. The destruction of that science ship, uh, her suspicions about what Marco Inaros is up to trying to get anybody else to listen to her. It really sort of in an interesting way, Avasaral sort of takes on the detective role in this episode. Um, which, you know, uh, I, we've never seen her in that mode before. She's always the one giving orders. She's always the one just sort of handing out uh, dictates. And now she's the one who's trying to figure out what's going on. She doesn't know what's happening. And she's doing some research and, and some investigation. I feel like, too, you know, we, we get a sense of how she got to where she got to, how resourceful and clever and smart and instinctive she is. Um, what was the doctor's name that in the, the opening, the interview, when they got all the information? I just don't remember. Okay. <laughs> well, it was a phenomenal scene. Uh, and then, you know, and then, and so that's when they really got a sense that it, it could be and probably is an attack. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this really kicks off that, that uh, multiple episode arc for her where she does have information that other people don't have. She's got, and like you said, she's smart. She's always the smartest person in the room. So she's put it together in a way that nobody else has put it together yet. And the problem we'll find going forward is she just can't get anyone to listen to her. Well, uh, so with, yeah, this kicks off, uh, you know, episode three really does kick off a lot of the long arcs for this season. You know, drummer finding uh, the Tynan, Ashford's ship, mm -hmm. um, really beginning her, her, connection to the free navy and marco mm -hmm. anaro starts from that point and mm -hmm. uh will play out over this season in a lot of uh un unexpected ways the way she interacts with marco and and the free navy there's a, a moment in here was the first time i've ever seen her vulnerable in the way that she is um and uh kara was so good in that scene and i think uh it drummer's so fascinating and you kind of see she, what she created that she had to create to survive, but there's a real vulnerability there because of what she feels for um, the dark, the, the ghost knife, you know, yeah. and the kind of relationship and connection they had. Yeah. Yeah. It, th that is one of the things we're doing with drummer all season is showing that other side of her life. Uh, so we should, you know, again, season or episode three has a lot of her family, this new family that she has, um, this sort of polyamorous, the crew is the family kind of relationship that she's got. Uh, and, and showing that sort of softer side of her, that vulnerable side of her. I mean, she's still tough. I, you wouldn't want to pick a fight with her. She'd still kill you. Yeah. But there is, there is some emotion in her. There's some vulnerability in her. And you get to see a little bit of that. Some tenderness when she's with her family. 
and then the the we get to see Naomi when she goes to the bar and then runs into the old Marco's crew. Yeah, and kind of starts to kick off that arc. And, and, that and two of my favorites, uh, two of my favorite uh, season long characters are uh, uh, Sin and Corral. So we'll continue talking about five hundred three, but I'm really excited to get to our guest. Uh, old Thomas Jane is joining Ty and that guy to discuss him directing the first episode of The Expanse that he has directed so far. Thomas, how are you, man? So glad you can hang out with us and join us. Yeah, I mean, it's been uh, what almost a year since we've seen you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I know I'm taxing been, our memories here. It would have been really early this year, you know, mm-hmm. January, February, right? Yeah, yeah, January. I, I can tell by your hair; it seems to have grown a couple of inches. <laughs> yeah, it has grown a couple. Of, it's and it's uh, it's just a mess. But you know, everybody's got COVID hair now, except except for uh, you. Two, uh, uh, no, no, no. I I brought my hat. Oh, nice. <laughs> I, don't have to mess. <laughs> I remember the first time I really got to hang out with you, Thomas. And I remember seeing you and said, I liked you right away. I was like, ah, you know, and the experience and what you brought as an actor and, and leadership in that role. And then I remember one night we were all having sushi and there was a fight that I wanted to go see. But it was a long walk. It was in the winter. It was in the middle of Toronto. And you were like, I'll go with you. And so you and I had, we walked a couple of miles, I think it was Canelo Alvarez fight or whatever, but I mean, it was a long walk. And on the walk, we started talking about old movies. We started talking about genre, horror, sci-fi. You were telling me about your comic book. Mm. And then I really connected with you. And, and one of the reasons Ty and I decided to do this thing is one of the things that I love most about when I got in this business is that I started to meet people that would as interested in story and talking about story as much as I am. And I couldn't exhaust them. And I realized you were, you were one of my people uh, when we did that. And then, you know, it just started that great thing. And uh, you know, we went and saw Blade Runner at the Cinesphere and we had, you know, all these great conversations about movies. And also you're a big King guy, Stephen King. Mm. And, and I'm a yeah. Yeah. Stephen King maniac. True. We've um, had a lot of the same influences and the same stuff. And, you know, we find our people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I actually want to start, and and I I, I actually want to start this off with a little bit of trivia. Uh-huh. Ty, I'm gonna put you on the spot. So, uh, Thomas has been involved in three Stephen King remakes or uh, adaptations. Adaptations. Do you know what those are? I mean, I do. <laughs> yeah, that's what, yeah, that's what I'm asking you. Oh, you put me on the spot, not Tom. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, you. He knows. He's <laughs> Thank God. No, I, I don't know. Oh, he, was, he was in The Mist. He was yeah. in 1922. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let's see. What's the third one? I'm running through all the Stephen King movies in my head. Um, I'll give you a clue. Uh, uh, Ass Weasel. <laughs> That's right. That's right. You were in uh, uh shit. What's, what's the name of that one? Uh, the one with the uh, dream catchers. Dream catcher. Right? Yes. Dream catcher. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't that, seen that one in a while. That was one of the most strangest scripts I've ever done. Apparently, Stephen King had wrote that after his accident. He was laid out on the floor because he couldn't. That's the only way. And he wrote it longhand uh-huh. uh, on a pad. Am I right about this, Wes? Yes. Yeah. And and he and, it, and of course, he was whacked out on painkillers. So right. it's one of the most bizarre, longest right. and just uh, mentally uh, mind bending f- uh, books that he's ever written. Yeah. Of course, we had to make a movie out of it. Right. Morgan Freeman and uh, everybody got together to do the cast reading. And we read this thing script by William Goldman. John Seal shot it. Larry Kasdan directed it. I mean, we had the best of the best. Out, we're all up there in t- Toronto, I think. And <laughs> we finish, Morgan Freeman looks up and he goes, what the hell is this <laughs> film about? <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know Kazan mm-hmm. directed that. Everybody laughed. Yeah, I, Kazan, oh, what a great guy. Tom, I did not know he like that. Tommy, Tommy, come on. So you've always been the storyteller and look at you, you got your own production company now, Renegade and, um, is is you know you've always been in the story is uh when did directing when did when did you get interested in becoming a director well i've i've always been interested in it you know i've always identified more with the directors than i than i did the actors of course love actors and 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 as a younger man i was all into james dean and montgomery clift and marlon brando those were my gods and i just 
got into, you know, I come from a generation where I think my, I think I was uh, 12 years old when my dad brought home this giant VHS player and it was a box and it actually had wood paneling on it. I mean, it was with the big thing that comes out the top and you slide that and that smell, the smell of the VHS, you know, the tape and the plastic had this certain smell to it. And it, and he popped that in and we, boom, there was a movie on our television and it, it was mind boggling, right? My, my parents, you know, were big movie guys. I mean, my dad took me to see Alien when I was eight years old because we didn't have money for a babysitter. So we'd pile everybody up, you know, and wait in line. And I, we saw the second showing in Washington, D.C. of Alien and waiting in line. I had no idea what the film was about. You know, I saw this big green egg with some steam coming out the bottom and in space, no one can hear you scream. And I was like, this could be a comedy. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I don't, no idea. And then the, the people, they let the first showing out and I see this pasty, chalky, blank expressions on the audience as they're walking out sort of in a daze. And I thought, what am I getting myself into here? I'm eight. And my, during the chest bursters course blew my, blew my mind. That was the beginning, you know, for me of, of film and the magic of the whole thing. When those letters, these lines start appearing, a line here and then a, 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 a dash there. And then they, they form the word alien. And mm -hmm. that was it, you know, when, yeah. when the chest burster happened, my mother threw her Coke on the lady behind us. <laughs> <laughs> she literally, the entire Coke, the lid flew off, the whole Coke went on the lady behind us. And she didn't get up to go to the bathroom and wipe herself <laughs> off. She stayed. Yeah. And, and, and that whole experience, you know, I made my father buy the, they, they, there used to be when you, you know, these, these little booklets with pictures and interviews. So I made him buy me this booklet on the way out. And I wore that thing. Uh, until, I, I read that thing until the cover fell off. I brought it to school. I told my friends the whole story. Cause of course they're, we're all eight, you know, no, nobody's parents is going to let them go see aliens. Except for right. Me. Um, so that was, that was the beginning. Was that, was that your first experience? Well, hold, hold, hold on. Cause I want to, I, I want to say this. It, how have you and I never talked about alien Thomas? It, I, like a, the movie alien is the single largest influence on the expanse. I, I saw huh. that. I saw that movie when I was like, I think 10 or 11. Yeah. And it never left my mind. And when we were creating the expanse, so, so the two, the two characters in alien, that are what the expanse is, is Parker and Brett. Yeah. The two guys, the two guys, uh, two of guys course. and jumpsuits walking around fixing pipes on a spaceship and they're treating it like a job. It's, it's they're not, they're not Starfleet. They're not admirals. They're not yeah. like fighting Klingons. There are a couple of guys with pipe wrenches fixing yeah. stuff and complaining that they don't get as much money as everybody yeah. else. Yeah. I mean, over time, if they're going to go down there on this rescue mission, how's that they're covered? Are we going to get fucking paid for that? Right, exactly. And those guys, those two guys are the foundation of the expanse. That makes perfect sense. Yep. It's yeah. And I love that. That's what I loved about the expanse, you know, that it treated it like a job, you know, when I read the script and of course read the books, it was a, um, it was, it was the, it had been it, the whole majesty of space travel had been incorporated into our consciousness in a way where it was just like being a coal miner. And, and I, I loved that. I, I, I would say that pro if, if there are three sci-fi movies that have had the most influence on me, Alien is probably sitting at, at number one. Just changed my whole view of what space was. You know, Ty, I'd love to hear you say that because I tell this story and, you know, sometimes I sort of get a blank expression. It changed my life. I mean, that seems like, that seems like a good segue to talk about directing our show. I mean... You know, you start out with that same influence. Alien turned you on to, to wanting to be an actor, uh, eventually wanting to be a director. Alien is the thing that made me want to write the books and eventually the screenplays for the show. You know, when you directed 503, we're, we're famously, we are a difficult show to direct. Yes. We're, we've got a lot of moving parts. We've, we've got a lot of stories, a lot of actors. Um, we've got a lot of technical elements, you know, people on wires, people in virtual sets. 
space uh, the space helmets, the, the helmets. fans that need to blow to, to make sure that you're fo- not fogging it up. Uh, it so goes I, on and on. But I, you, you, you shadowed one of our directors uh, for a couple episodes to just sort of get into the groove of it, and then directed five hundred three. And my my question, the thing I've always wanted to ask you, I never got a chance while we were on set, is having been through the the shadowing process, and you're you obviously you've been acting for a long time. You've been on a ton of film sets. Probably very few things are surprising to you, but. In your first episodic directing thing on our show, was there anything that was the biggest surprise for you as a, as a director on our show? I just, I wanted to be as prepared as humanly possible. You know, I'm, I'm a fan uh, first. So, you know, my number one goal was to deliver the, the best uh, episode that, that, that I could. Um, so, you know, Every day is a surprise as a director, you know, like I said, there's constantly moving parts and you're constantly having to improvise. Um, I was knocked out by the preparedness of every head of department, you know, and the detail in the production meetings that needed to be gone through. And, we, you know, you have countless production meetings and they focus on different elements of your production um, each one sort of has its, its own independent focus. And just the, the, what these guys were bringing to the party, you know, uh, the creativity, uh, you know, uh, whether it's props or it's VFX, um, uh, costumes, you know, and, and those, those kind of, I was surprised by the well-oiled machine that The Expanse had become in, in, uh, in this was just our third season, fourth. Am I right? (laughs) So also people drop their jobs, whatever job that they happen to be on. When the expanse says we're back up and rolling, people drop their jobs to come back, you know, and that's I've never seen that before. Um, The family that's been created, you know, with uh, with the whole with the whole group. You know, and of course it starts with the top. It starts with you guys. One thing I'm interested in is a little bit about process because I know being able to work with you as an actor and doing rehearsals and stuff with you and the actual work in preparation for an actor and understanding the arc, beginning, middle and end, where you're coming from, where you're going, what you want. How do you adapt that process when you're looking at the whole macro story and how do you do you do that kind of character work for each character within the story that you were telling within the thing? And you can make it specific to 503 in, in kind of how did you, how did you adapt your acting process to the greater process of directing coming through? I, I absolutely uh, to take the same approach, you know, um, and it, it, when I'm working on a part, it, I'm, I'm interested in my character and, and how my character tells the story that we're telling but I'm also, as an actor, try to look at the story globally and see how do I fit into the actual story that is being told. So there's not a lot of difference. You're just flipping your focus. You know, my number one focus is my, my part as a performer and then how the story wraps around that. So as a director, my number one focus is the story and how the actors wrap around so you're approaching the same material with the same set of eyeballs, but the focus becomes about marrying a lot of different elements together to form the story. And to tell you the truth, I had a blast working on the different character arcs. And I made a point to sit down with the director, uh, with the actors to find time, you know, even if it was just 15 minutes, but come into the office and, you know, address any sort of questions or, and, and get them on the same page because I've got an idea of what I feel like will be fun for this character and how to tell the story of whatever scenes that he or she is in. And, but I, I want to make sure before we get on set that the actors are also on the same page with me, you know, and they bring me ideas and, and it evolves, you know, as it goes. And that's the fun part, you know, uh, actors, good actors bring something that you couldn't have thought of. Mm-hmm. Uh, and knowing that early enough allows me to think about it and how to tell that uh, her story or his story uh, with the camera, 
you know, mm -hmm. kn knowing where she wants to go. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, and then hopefully offering an idea of, of what would be fun. You know, what's the fun, what's the most compelling, what's the most dramatic way to tell this mm -hmm. story in, in your little, in your arc. What is directing taught you about acting? Um, to relax. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good you know, one. It's so yeah. wonderful because as an actor, you want every moment to be on. You know, yeah. and you mm -hmm. want every you want the whole take to be great. Mm -hmm. But that but as a director, you know, you're looking and you're like the first half of take one was amazing. All I need is the second half. Mm -hmm. But, you know, of course, you don't go up there and go, hey, all we need is the second half. Yeah. Of course, you know, mm -hmm. you, you, but but your focus becomes about that. Right. And you're weaving that together. But as an actor. You're thinking, okay, you know, now, now take three. Okay, fuck, what do I do? You know, and you're trying to, and you're trying to deliver an, a, a finished product, you know, and, mm -hmm. and the truth is what we can do in the editing room is beautiful. I can take the dialogue mm -hmm. from one take and insert it into the picture of another take and we can match it, you mm -hmm. know, we yeah. can slip it in and match it and squeeze it and stretch it. And we can, and so I can get the performance that I want from, from two different, entirely different takes. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an actor, it, it, it gives me permission to relax. Mm -hmm. And especially if, if you're working with somebody that you trust, you know, because you, you know, that um, it's all on the table, you know, I, I, the, the pressure of having to deliver um is is uh because it becomes freer it gives me the opportunity to be freer so as a yes i've learned a lot or absorbed a lot mm -hmm. through the directing process what's interesting is so we we went back and watched the, all these episodes to prepare for this and get ready and every director has a certain signature has just a certain vibe that you can if you're looking for it you can tell there's something and i remember getting to 503 because i was just streaming through and binging them yeah, and I remember seeing the ice and the, the speed of the ice slow down as it was going in the bowl. And I saw the way that the that the 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 room was photographed and it just felt like I go, who directed this? And I said, oh, shit, this is Thomas J directed this one. Yeah. And then I really paid attention. And in terms of art direction, how do you make those choices? How do you connect the way you shoot something to hi to uh, highlight the story or, or to use yeah. that to enhance the story in the yeah. character's point of view. That, that, that's right. Yes. That's th those are the clues that I'm constantly looking for. How do I tell the story? You know, the, the ice cubes came out of the idea of, um, well, two ideas. One is that they're on the moon. So if we could capture that l less than, you know, one third gravity, if we could capture that right away. Um, and then just the, the ice, the, the mo the, our story ends with a giant meteor slamming into the earth. So I thought, well, it'd be fun to, to do that in miniature and have the ice scooper slam into the ice cubes and have them, you know, uh, so that there's, and that, that, that's how these, these things are born. <laughs> you know, it's absolutely about how do I sort of marry these parts? How do I do some interesting foreshadowing? Um, and, and try to keep on point, you know, with, with what's the story about, you know, what, what's the, what happens, you know, in, in this, you know, and, and for me in 503, we had a bit of a ticking clock and the ticking clock was that we were going to end with a explosion. We we're going to end with disaster. Um, and that ticking clock, some act, some characters are aware of and other characters aren't. You know, some people know something's coming and some people don't. Um, but to keep that alive, you know, when Naomi walks into the bar, I wanted uh, to have a ticking clock above her. And, and then the, the, we had to get creative and like, why the hell would there be a countdown? So we came up with the shift change. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, a time towards shift change. Uh -huh. um, uh, and stuff like that, I'm trying to insert the, the idea of a countdown. You know, throughout the you watch, uh, uh, Hitchcock movies before you did that to kind of <laughs> attention and well, go. I really love Hitchcock. He's yeah, huge. he's a master at that building that tension. Right, and and then how do we um, also as a director, you're thinking about pace. You know, wh which scenes move, 
And then how do you, so now I've got a little bit of breathing room so I can relax the pace a little bit. Um, you know, and, and choosing the pace from scene to scene creates your sort of the rhythm of how you watch the show throughout that hour. Yeah. Um, and that's fun, right? Because you have that in your back of your mind, you know, and so you're like, okay, this has to move, you know, like there was a long opening scene with the ice cube stuff. They're in a bar, uh, the, the officer's club. And, uh, and there's a long sort of, uh, info, a lot of information is being said. And my task directing those actors was keep it moving, keep it moving, keep it moving, keep the pace up. Come on, you know, this is the, the, the urgency of the situation might not be reflected in, in a lot of the dialogue, but it's there, it's there. So reminding the actors of that kind of stuff is why you need a director. Because actors will just take all the time in the world, you know, they point the camera at me, you know. Make a meal out of every minute. <laughs> I'm going to milk every moment I can here, you know, and, uh, and, and, and you need a director to say, slow it down or speed it up, you know. We, we, we did not make it easy on you because uh, uh, one of the things that happens in, in the fifth season and really starts to, to spread out in 503, which was your episode, is all of these new characters. You know, Brent showing up as Naomi's old friend and Olenike showing up as Naomi's old friend and, and all of Drummer's crew, you know, the yeah, family and, that Drummer's got. And, Those are all new, her, new characters. And her son. Uh, and her son. Yeah, so we, we threw a lot of new people at the show that all kind of show up in 503. So uh, having a director who can get all of the actors kind of telling the same story in the same tone and all that stuff was really important. So, yeah, we, did, we didn't give you an easy job there. <laughs> well, you know, all of them have their uh, challenges, right? And, but yeah, I, I, I loved it, you know, and, and it was an acting heavy piece, too. And there's some great scenes. I love the scenes with drummer. You know, I, I, I really uh, connected to those and had so and I love the scenes with Naomi. There's some really emotional stuff going on. You guys picked the right one for me. You know, um, uh, you, an, an actor who could get in there and get their hands dirty with the other actors that I could win their trust quickly because I could speak their language and know what they wanted and support them and, and, uh, and, and, and let them know that they were supported and that someone was watching, you know, if you, if you deliver something great, I'm going to see it. Um, and, and that was really, really fun. I've been told more than once by actors that, that the most important thing, the thing that makes them feel safe on a set, is knowing that the director, one, sees their best stuff and remembers it, and two, won't let them get away with something that's bad. Like, Absolutely. That's safety net, yeah. Yep, that's the safety net. And, and the quicker you can establish that with an actor, the faster you can, you can get to the good stuff, you know? So you're not building that. Tr and that's the other thing which was great for me coming in was that I, half of the guys, or maybe more, I knew, you know, from, from seasons past. So we already had a relationship to build on. Um, and that, that was really helpful. But then the other, in rehearsal, where you, and we make sure to rehearse, and I don't know if a lot of TV shows do this, but I know that you guys are really big on getting together on the weekends and going over the week, the week's work that's coming up, you know, and sitting down with all the actors over the week. So there, there's no time off, which is beautiful, you know, for me. And some of my favorite stuff is just getting together with the actors and rehearsing with nobody around. And then you can throw out ideas and you talk and you laugh and you drink coffee and, and you're, and everything's on the table at that point. Right. And, and, and that's a lot of fun is a, that's when the ideas come and that's when you start sculpting the scenes. Uh, and playing, you know, and then by the end of rehearsal, you have a, you know what you're doing, you know what's required, you know what, uh, what I'm looking for, I know what they're looking for, and we can hit the ground running. It was a really interesting moment uh, when Naomi meets her son for the first time, and the way that it was shot, it was almost like he was walking through the room, he wanted to see her and then go, but then she noticed him and stopped. Was that a was that a your choice that the way that it was staged with him walking through and well kind of the scene as written is is you know he comes into the bar and they sit at the table and have a scene right and that and that's perfectly legitimate and how you how you write it you know is just because what's important is what they say to each other but I got to bring that to life in a visual way 
So I wanted her to be, I wanted it to be a lonely bar. I wanted her to have been there for a while. So we see uh, empty, empty cups and she's on her phone. And I thought, you know, there's, uh, so I have, I have him walk in, but she sees him in the reflection of her uh, handheld communicator. What do they call him? <laughs> Gone. You know, what do you call him? Cell phone things. Uh, <laughs> So I had, I had her, so we did a plate shot and I, and I, he sort of walks into his own focus. So he starts out as just this blurry sort of image. And then he comes in to focus in her uh, reflection of, of her machine. And um, she turns and then we can have, so it, it's, it's a way of sort of bringing him into her consciousness in a way that, uh, you know, is for me more interesting than him just standing in the doorway and she looks up and there's the kid. You know, this is an important moment for her and she hasn't seen this kid and, and it's, a, it's a big deal. And then there's a kind of a standoff, you know, where, where he just kind of looks at her, right? And she's under the microscope. She's sort of naked standing there and lets him observe her. Um, which, which, and, and then he, and he might just, keep on going and walk out the other door. Yeah, I, I agree with Wes. I, I, the way it's shot adds an element to that that isn't on the page in that we get the sense that he's still deciding if he's going to say anything at all, that, that he may walk in, look at her, and then may just decide to keep on walking. And that's not on the page, but uh, it's a great example of what a director brings to the material that that not everything is on the page and, and those moments can be crafted by the way you shoot it and the way you, you know, how you stage the actors and that kind of stuff. And it really adds an element to that moment yeah. that I think is a great, it's a great element. Uh, oh, yeah. that, that wasn't in the scripts, uh, you know, and, it has, and it has so much more of an impact. It yeah. has so much more right. the yeah. fact that he can't not, he so wants to see her, but he doesn't want to give her that. But he wants to see her and yeah. him walking through. And I, she calls his name and he fucking wants to leave, but he can't leave. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It's just beautiful. And it's done visually and fluid and moving. And you're telling yes. so much of the story without any dialogue at that point. Well, that's, that, that's that storytelling entirely through blocking. That's, that's the director telling a story just by where he puts the camera and where he stages the actors. That yeah. not a word spoken. It's, it's right. beautiful when it happens. Thank you. That, that's the fun part of the job. You know, you're always looking at what if I didn't have any dialogue to tell this story? Yeah. You know, and, and, and then, of course, this is a visual medium. So how do I move the actors and the camera in a way that establishes whatever it is that I relationship that I want people to to take away from this? So if you turn the sound down, you know that this is a, 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 a something's going on between these two and, and uh, they're scoping each other out and they're not quite sure, you know, how to do it, you know? And, I, and that comes from reading the scene and, and saying, you know, and just what are the given circumstances, you know, this is, here's a kid who has been taught to hate this woman. And here's a woman who has been, you know, uh, abolished from his life and has, and has, and knows that she's coming in with a deck with a deck stacked against her, and um, and how do these human human beings r relate? You know, and that's where the fun starts coming in. You know, is that, and then you can uh, get some ideas uh, about how to tell the story, you know? and that that really is the funnest part for direct of directing for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's figuring out if I didn't have any dialogue to tell this story, if this was a silent film. How can I communicate what's going on? When we do the deep dive on Alien, I'm going to yeah. call you. You agreed to do it. And, you know, basically we're going to go in and really talk about how it influenced Ty, how it influenced me and how it influenced you. What, and, and how do we, we got, for me, that was the introduction to sci-fi horror. Right. right? Cause I, I haven't, I've, I've never seen anything like that. And it's just interesting to me that my favorite sci-fi horror is Alien and my favorite sci-fi action is Aliens. <laughs> but there's yeah. something so special yeah. about those two movies and it had such a, a powerful impact and you know and this kind of 
a lot of the things. So when we go into it, when we do that deep dive, we're going to talk about it. But we really appreciate you coming on and hanging out and explaining, talking to us about 503. This was a good time, man. That is it for 503, telling that guy. Uh, I want to thank our guest, Tommy Jane, for coming in and talking about him directing his production company, all the things he's got going. It's really exciting. Uh, please like and subscribe, the little button down here. And, uh, and uh, join us next one when we talk about 504. <laughs> Great to see you guys. Look at this. This is what it's like working on a studio.